Okay. So, good morning, guys. Uh, Raphael, again, in case you don't figure out what my name is. Today, we're talking about spatial conservation planning. Uh, but you know, this is the last day of the, of the course. It's, it's, um, you have good things about being the last one to talk and bad things about doing the last one to give this talk. The bad thing is that you have this huge responsibility of giving a good talk and a good course after all the good work these guys have done during the week. The bad thing is that, the, the bad thing is that everybody's uh, kind of tired and doing a lot of stuff. So I will start this uh, course today with a quote from a guy called Billy Idol. And this guy <laughs> says something like, if your world doesn't allow you to dream, move to one where you can. This is from this guy, Billy Idol. So <laughs> very good to, to be here and to talk to you about conservation planning. So the outline of this, I, I've prepared three parts. Uh, there's actually kind of three talks uh, covering different aspects of conservation planning. The first one will be a more conceptual one. I will just we'll have a chat about what is conservation planning, what are the objectives of these, why conservation planning is so important. So <clears throat> for this part, I will start with a, br a brief historical perspective on the field. Then I'll tell you where are we now, what kind of analysis we can do, and the softwares uh, that are available for using. Then I will talk a little about the, what does the future hold for systematic conservation planning, and what are the challenges, and what are the things that we are still need to develop methods to deal with. And then I'll, I'll close with some concluding remarks for, for this part of the talk, okay? So, there we go. You know, the establishment of conservation error is, is still the cornerstone of conservation actions. The, the, the most cost-effective way we still have to protect nature is to do in situ conservation, is to set aside some area where species could live and populations could uh, persist for a long time, okay? But generally, and all over the world, conservation areas have been uh, established for other reasons uh, that are not necessarily scientific, okay? They're not science-based actions in doing that. So many conservation areas are just established in beautiful places with great scenic view, like the Iguaçu Falls in Brazil, one of the most beautiful waterfalls we have in the world. That's a good place to have a protected area because you're not going to do any other thing like that. There's no other land use to such a place. Or maybe you can create a protected area to save uh, an important species, a threatened species, or a charismatic species like the golden lion tamarind, which is endemic to the Atlantic forest, and a highly threatened species in Brazil, for example. But you can have game reserves, arena reserves, and, and other stuff like that. The problem is that when you do that, you are basically saying that it's good to put a conservation area in, in any place that is no good for other land use. So what happens worldwide is that if you take a look at uh, places with increasing fertility, places with high fertile soils are not good to place protected areas because these places are, uh, are very good for doing agriculture, for example. Same goes for Increasing slope areas, conservation areas are usually not uh, established on flat lands. Usually it has, it usually has some kind of uh, very irregular relief. So the total area preserve is almost in order, is mo mainly placed in, in sites that you don't have any other use like agriculture or other things like that. But the result of this is that you get problems with poor representation of species. So you end up with species out of protected areas. So this is the case of this moss species in Alberta, Canada, 
This is the distribution of the species. The green areas are protected areas in the state. And then only 3% of the distribution of this species is within any kind of protected area. And most part of the distribution is out of this protected area. So we call this a gap species. This species is not protected. Any uh, very small part of its range is actually protected inside a reserve. And this is a problem. And we have to figure out how can we fill these gaps? How can we do? How can we establish protected areas in a way that we will cover species that are not currently protected? So we started thinking about this um, about 30 years ago. And back to the 80s, we started thinking about how can we put this problem into a conceptual problem, a mathematical problem that can be solved thinking about optimization theory. How can I optimize uh, the, the limited resources I have to get the most out of my action for conserving species. So we're, at that time, we're dealing with problems that were conceptually powerful, but very simple. For example, we are trying to think about just one species or single population, and what would be the minimum necessary habitat patches that we need to conserve to get this population uh, viable in the long term, okay? We're trying to minimize the number of sites that we need to protect so the species will uh, be protected. So <clears throat> the field is going, developing in, in, in the 90s, we're discussing a lot of methodological issues. So how can we do that? What are the best methods to do the, this kind of analysis? And we have a lot of discussions about the adaptation of exact algorithms to conservation planning, the huge debate between heuristic versus stochastic optimization methods. In heuristic methods, you, you only get one uh, single solution. And you, you're not sure if this solution is the best one. In stochastic optimization methods, you can have a lot of solutions. Then you can combine the solutions, hoping that you will find the best one. And this is a huge discussion. We also were, at that time, developing methods for dealing with changes in landscapes and habitat loss. In the 2000s, um, two uh, scientists, Chris Margulis and my friend Bob Pressey, they synthesized of this, the work that has was been doing for the last 20 years. And they published this very influential paper in Nature called systematic conservation planning. They're just trying to build a protocol of analysis, a series of steps that you should uh, follow to get your conservation plan done and get uh, the actions you were trying to, to, to do really implemented in, in nature. This has been extensively, extensively reviewed since then. We have plenty of review papers. We have a textbook on this, and this is called Systematic conservation planning. In systematic conservation planning, it's a very simple thing, a very simple idea. It's a way to solve the resource allocation problem in conservation. I mean, you have some limited resources, you have conservation problems that you need to solve, and you want to know what is the best decision you can make to get the problem solved with that limited resources. That's just about it. So the aim is to identify the spatial allocation of conservation resources that will produce the most beneficial long-term conservation outcome. So it's just like, uh, you, you can say it like that. You want to protect a bit of everything. You, you want to keep the cost low. And you want to annoy as few people as possible. That's pretty much it, the idea of systematic conservation planning. So for doing so, you obviously will need to have some kind of systematic uh, approach. And you, you will need to uh, stick to these four basic principles that we have in conservation planning and that we call care. That will be that your plan should be comprehensive, adequate, representative, and effective. Okay. 
So by comprehensive, I mean that ideally you will sample every kind of biodiversity you have. With all the data that is available, you will try to get all samples of biodiversity, everything that matters to be uh, conserved as your conservation goal, and you, you do a plan based on that, okay? In practice, this is tough. So in practice, you, you're using as many kinds as possible. And we call that things, that goals, the things they want to, cons to preserve, we call it features. So you can have species as features, and you use species distribution, species abundance, uh, probabilities of recurrency, anything like that. It could be habitat types, you're trying to protect different types of habitat or ecosystems. Could be ecological processes like uh, functional diversity, maybe phylogenetic diversity, okay? So these are the features you are trying to protect. And you should have as many kinds of that, that, those features as possible, okay? So by adequate, we mean that the protecting, you should be protecting enough to ensure the persistence of these biodiversity features. This is really hard, this is very tough, because you will need to have some measure of viability, of population viability, for example, so you know that your plan is adequate. And this is really difficult to get, especially if you are trying to make a plan for a huge number of species. So this is usually addressed with targets. You mean, if, you're, if your feature is the species distribution, for example, you can predefine as a, a, a target for the protection of that species. You say, for example, this species, we should protect at least 10% of its distribution, right? That's a target, 10% of the distribution of the species. And you assume, based on scientific knowledge, the biology of species, or relying on expert opinion, that this target is enough to ensure the persistence of populations, okay? So you are saying, the planner is saying, that 10% of the distribution of species will be enough, we will have enough viable populations within this 10% of the distribution so the species will not go extinct, okay? This is actually what we do. We try to set targets to address this kind of persistence. Then representative means that your plan, your, you, you should sample across the full range of variation of each feature. So if you're working with species, you should have as many species as possible. As possible. If you're working with birds, you should uh, cover the, the largest possible number of families and genera and birds and not only protect a specific kind of feature. And then your plan should be effective. It means that you should achieve objectives for minimum cost. So again, the bottom line here is that you should annoy as few people as possible. This, this cost usually ends up as a combination of many different interests. Some of them are really economic, and you can put a price on land, you can have some kind of opportunity costs, okay? But some of them are not. So, we usually use this cost as a constraint to, to the analysis. It could be a social uh, cost, it could be an economic cost, it could be a political cost. It usually means that you are trying to solve a conflict when uh, trying to uh, implement a conservation action. It could be creating um, sites for conservation, creating, establishing protected areas, but it also could be managing some protected area, managing fire uh, within natural areas, or trying to uh, reduce invasion of invasive species, okay? Any kind of conservation action should be uh, effective in terms that the cost you are using, whether it is economic or not, should be addressed, it should be included in the planning because costs play a critical role in conservation actions, right? And then there is another thing. 
it's very important, so you, you have to know that. As we are trying to establish these protected areas in a more systematic way, it, it will be very good if you can define the problem you have as a mathematical problem. So you actually have a, a, an optimization problem and you have to define it formally so e your objective is very clear for anyone involved in the planning, okay? And we have basically two types of uh, general problems in, in conservation. This, this is the first one, it's called the minimum set coverage problem. It means that you, you want to represent a given proportion of biodiversity at the minimum possible cost, okay? So, let's, we'll take a look at this equation, then I will explain uh, all of the parameters. You have this uh, objective function. This is a mathematical function that translates the objective of your planning. I'm calling Z. Then you have a cost for each side, I, okay? You have this uh, control variable called Xi. It's Xi is one if you are selecting that site, and it is zero if the site is not selected. So if it is zero, you multiply the cost by zero, and this site will have no weight in your decision. But if you pick up that site, then you include the cost of that site. And this function is, is uh, really a, a summation of the costs of all area that you have picked up to build a conservation area network, okay? <clears throat> but then, uh, how can I decide if I am going to pick up that place or not? So you have a target for the species J, for example, let's say it is protecting 10% of the distribution of that species, this is DJ. And you're only picking up a site if the sites you're choosing to uh, be inside your conservation area network, they achieve a given level of representation of the species J in those sites, I. Uh, 